This episode of Why Educational Games Should Be Awesome, we're going to start our last big topic concept chain. It comes last because we've kind of been building outward. We started at the core at the beginning with motivation, how to get people interested. From there, having talked about how to get people interested, we could talk about how to keep people interested while delivering the content you want, helping them learn, be it how to play your game or the causes of World War I, or both. And that finally brings us here to concept chain. Once you have people interested and you deliver the information, how to get them to internalize it, how to actually change how someone thinks about something be it a better understanding of physics or literature. Now at this point in the series, you can probably guess that the same themes that have been popping up are going to keep being the driving force. Make new ideas relevant to the audience's interests. Give them agency in exploring them. Demonstrate how they're useful and valuable. Here is where those ideas become super important though, because getting people to actually change their minds is really hard. As you may be aware of from interacting with, you know, people you disagree with on the internet or, you know, anywhere else. However, I would argue that this is actually the most frustrating in classrooms, where arguably the whole point is to improve students' understanding of new ideas. But at the same time, it's hard to convince them to accept new ideas, either explicitly or more deeply. Like in colleges, there was a study where many physics majors can explicitly explain gravity as if they're experts, but solve problems as if they're novices, showing that they didn't really internalize what they're reciting when you explicitly ask them. On the other hand, in grade schools, you can just get flat out rejection. Like a study where a bunch of students were shown a demonstration about how heat and temperature are different things, and were just like, nope, that's clearly crazy. No, I don't think that's right. And that's a problem, not just for those students, but for science education and for education in general. Now to understand why games are such an exciting solution to this problem, first we need to understand the problem better. What's going on here? Why is it so hard to convince people to accept new ideas? Now if we go to the literature on concept change, two of the main factors are that significant change takes energy, so people avoid doing it, and something called naive theory. So let's start there. Naive theories are theories someone has about how something works basically from their own experience. The term comes specifically from students in science classrooms. They don't come in as blank slates. They come in with some intuitions about how the world works because they've been interacting with that world. Okay, example, the earth is flat and the sun orbits it. Like, it's really easy to see how those theories form and get reinforced, right? Just in the course of being in the world, you have these experiences like seeing the horizon, seeing the sun rise and set, and this is how you make sense of them. In general terms, this is actually like a form of scientific thinking, you know, using your observations to come up with a theory and using it to predict things, like that the sun is going to rise in the east. The problem with naive theories is that while they're useful to have, they make it really hard to change because all the data you're accumulating, all your experiences, are interpreted through the lens of that naive theory. You look at history and you can see this too. Even when you have something that contradicts the current theory in favor of a new theory, you can run into this perceptual issue where all the previous evidence, which equally supports both theories, is interpreted as supporting the current theory, which causes issues when people say they're trying to weigh the evidence. This brings in kind of a roundabout way to the other point. The change is hard, so people are motivated to avoid it, which means they can be motivated to be biased. I mean, think about having worked out this system. You had this Earth-centric map of the solar system and all of these star charts and diagrams, and suddenly you realize the sun's at the center, and you have to redo all these things, even if the math is easier now. That's a lot of work. It takes a lot of time and energy to make that shift. I mean, it's not like moving furniture, but it still works. So you get both these factors making it hard to make meaningful change. Now, in the literature, there's this recurrent theme of sort of two kinds of concept change, from Piaget all the way to today. One is sort of peripheral change that maintains the core, but sort of fiddles with the details. One is significantly changing that core idea. Let me give you an example. Say you're a gardener. You make a plant food that works great for your carrots and tomatoes. You might have the theory this plant food makes plants grow. So you try it on your cabbages. They die. It kills them. No, my cabbages! You may revise your theory to makes plants grow except for cabbages. This is an example of a peripheral change. You keep that core idea of making plants grow and add the detail except for cabbage. Now you may try it on a few more plants and revise your theory to kills plants except tomatoes and carrots. And that would be a significant change to the core idea. And note in this example how it took more evidence to get that significant change. It's not your first response. It's harder. People want to avoid it. Okay, so there's our two big hurdles to significant, meaningful conceptual change. Everything's viewed through the lens of the current theory, and change is hard, so people want to avoid it. Or briefly, people are lazy, and they don't know that thing that they don't know. Now, I don't want to just end on that note that, you know, Concept change is hard, and people never change their minds, because clearly people do change their minds. People significantly change their minds 
every day in significant ways and learn new and amazing things. These are just obstacles that make it difficult. Also, while I'm discussing this in terms of science, because that's where my background is, this is a more general issue. Like, there can be competing schools of economics that look at the same market shift and view it as evidence for both their theories. You can have students come into a history or an English classroom and the students come in with their own ideas of what a work means or what caused an event. And you'll see the teachers have the same sorts of issues that we've been discussing. So how do we deal with these obstacles? Next time we'll talk about why games are good at addressing these obstacles and are particularly good at helping people understand new perspectives and new ideas. Mm -hmm.